Now, yesterday, yesterday we talked about feelings, especially the bodily feelings. As I, as I said, that feelings are feelings can be directly known, can be directly known by the mind, and they are part of the whole. Uh, op, they are part of the objects of vipassana meditation. Although it's easier said than done, but the fact that our misconception, our cravings, our expectation comes in together with those feelings. So when it comes with that feelings, when we pay attention, we note those feelings, we attach, we tag the feeling, we tag the, the, the craving together with it without we realizing it. Uh, we put in the expectation there, uh, wanting to it to stop, wanting it how it stop, uh, trying to escape it, try to do some other thing in order to cover up the feelings. Uh, so it's in so many ways, yogis, you know, one time or another, you may do this in your practice. Even if you have said here, even if, if I repeated these talks for another ten times, you will still do it also. But the fact that this is the nature of our craving. Uh, in the Vipassana, it's not about the mistakes that we do. It is important for us to see the mistakes. It's the important to see the errors that come together with it. Then it's important for us to get out, to, to understand this ad error, and then we come back to the right way of doing it. Then later on, you will do the same mistake all over again, and yet, again and again you will do it. But the, but the thing is that you have the knowledge, you have the understanding to come out of it. This is crucial part of vipassana. We are not looking here for a yogi to be perfect. If you think you are a perfect yogi, then is something wrong with you. Here we begin to see our imperfections. To begin to see the different imperfections that comes together with our noting. Together with the mind, you see the defilements, you see the hindrances, you see the craving, you see the greed, you see the anger. Uh, we begin to acknowledge them. We begin to face to face with them. This is how we begin to improve in this vipassana meditation. Mm. <clears throat> now, we're still in the, this clear comprehension of non-delusion. Where we begin, as I said, we're able to take we know what are the right objects to pay attention to, yeah? then we must be able to scrutinize it, investigate it, note it, being precise, being thorough, noticing what is really going on with those objects. Mm? Mm. Again, there's another aspect of how sometimes yogis also may not be feelings, but be, becomes with other objects that the yogi get stuck with them. Uh, now, you see that day, I talk about the different level of wisdom. Uh, the first level of wisdom is the wisdom that arises through hearing, the right knowledge. Uh, and you hear the, the, the knowledge about karma, about uh, precepts, about dependent origination, fall noble truth, because those dhamma, those knowledge, they are timeless, akalika, akaliko, timeless. They are timeless and they are parallel with the reality. And they are parallel with the reality. Worldly knowledge does not fall under this type of wisdom. Yeah? Because worldly knowledge changes over time. So this is the first one. The second one, once we're able to, understand, able to get the knowledge, 
then we reflect in the mind. We reflect in the mind, we have a, a certain view about it, we understand it, uh, we have a certain judgment over it, we have a certain opinion about it, the theory, or whichever that you want to call it. Uh, this is due to you able to take those wisdom that you heard or you have read and you scrutin, you mentally uh, think about it, you ponder over it, you reflect about it. Uh, so this is the second level of wisdom. Yeah? Uh, and when you reflect, it goes along with the reality. Then it's correct. Because sometimes, as I said again, sometimes even you may have a lot of knowledge, but when it comes to the to the reflection, thinking, pondering, judging, researching, or so on, they may do it wrongly in the sense that they go out of reality. What the truth. Yeah? Although they have heard the right way, but they interpret it wrongly. Yeah? There are many people out there who are like that. As I said, like yesterday, when people have understand about the feelings, pain, and so on, yesterday I mentioned that sometimes monks or speakers or nuns, they may speak about, you know, you don't have to pay attention to all the pain. Uh, you come into the meditation center, why, what for? You want to come in to see all those pain, all the suffering. So what it means here is that although they understand what the knowledge of the Dhamma, but when it comes into thinking and reflection about it, they begin to get have a, their own way of looking into things and they do not want to see this truth. And they cover up with another truth. This is something what I mean here. Uh, they can, the whole thinking can get distorted. So there's a third level of this wisdom. Uh, then the third level of the wisdom is, comes from direct understanding that you begin to see it not by thinking, but by direct seeing the nature of the objects. Now here it, div it divides into two, the samatha wisdom and the vipassana wisdom. Mm. Yeah. So you need, you need the first type of wisdom, the second type of wisdom, in order for the third type to grow. Yeah? For example, you need to know how to meditate. You must heard about it somewhere. You must, you must think about it somewhere. Then only you can be able to do it. Yeah? If you have not heard and you have not this one, you might, perhaps you may not be able to do it at all. Yeah. Yeah. So the third type of wisdom is conditioned by what you've heard and what you have uh, reflected. And then... You put into practice, then you begin, if you do it rightly, you begin to develop a certain degree of wisdom. Yeah. Now, there are two aspects of the, the knowledge and the development here. Yeah. Uh, one is the vipassana and one is the samatha. The development of the samatha is also a kind of wisdom because you have to directly see it as it is also. Inverted comma. Uh, directly seeing it. If you want to see jhana, if you want to see, to able to able to notice what is jhana, you cannot just read from the book, oh, I got this uh, first uh, factor, the second factor of the jhana, the third factor of jhana, therefore is jhana. No, it's not like that. You have to see the directly the jhana itself. Uh, seeing it, the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth jhana, you know, those are deep knowledge, deep penetration of the mind. Uh, without much of a wisdom, hmm, you can't be able to develop even samatha meditation also. Uh, what more about vipassana? Uh, so, not just only the jhana, but before the jhana, which one is the preliminary exercises, which one is the deeper exercises, which one is the uh, um, excess concentration, what, which one is the preliminary concentration, what is, which one is the apana samadhi, the, the absorption concentration. There are different kinds of 
Wisdom is inside there. And they are very helpful to develop if you have the time. But the goal for the samatha is not getting out of cycle of birth and rebirth. Although it can be very helpful for vipassana that you have developed here, but on their own, they cannot get you out of cycle of birth and rebirth. They can get you into a much better planes of existence than you are here. Much longer you, you can... You can live, but they are still in samsara for a long, long period of time. Mm. Uh, the, the, the merits, the, the, the effect, the cause and effect that comes together with it. Uh, uh. Whereas on the wisdom of, of uh, vipassana, the wisdom of vipassana is different because the goal here is to get out of this cycle of birth and rebirth. Realizing of nibbana. If you're able to realize Nibbana, that means the eradication of defilements already taken place. So when the eradication take, has taken place, therefore you're able to realize Nibbana, cessation of Dukkha. So this is the goal here. So even with this, the goal, the end, but the process of developing towards the goal, these are also needs to be directly known. And this also needs to be directly known by yourself and nobody else. It, can be, it needs to be directly known. So tonight, we're going to see this part here, how the directly known leads you to you know, a brief understanding of how those Nibbana can be realized. But first, before we come to this path, a yogi also needs to discern, separate between what is a Samatha development and what is a Vipassana development. Because sometimes if a yogi in the Vipassana meditation and is not guided properly, it will tend to go into Samatha. If you go into Samatha. If you don't go into Samatha, you go into something wrong. You are neither in Samatha nor Vipassana. Yeah. Most, of, most of the time, uh, it's neither Samatha nor Vipassana. I don't know where you are. Yeah. Honestly speaking. <laughs> Somewhere trapped inside the mind just because that you do not know how to pay attention to the object again. Again here is the craving and the expectation are also involved inside. So don't underestimate just because yesterday we talked about feelings, you know about all your craving. It's just waiting for you around every corner that you bend and you turn. Yeah? My job is just to show you. Perhaps you may not be able to see it so fast. Maybe 10 years down the road, maybe, you know, a few retreats down the road, maybe tomorrow, who knows, you know. Now, one of the aspects of a yogi tend to have, trying to develop some vipassana aspect of development, but somehow it goes out from the path, from the observation from the, 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 uh, from the proper objects. Although he may still take up the right objects, but wrong way of paying attention this time. You still get the right object, but you're wrong way of paying attention. Yeah? <clears throat> now, take, a, take an example. Eh? Take an example of an in-breath, out-breath of the, the, of the breath here. Yeah. Uh, for, first of all, uh, sometimes uh, we pr here uh, some yogis thought that we practice this rising and falling already. Uh, you must not touch in breath, out breath. As if like in breath, out breath is something evil. You know? It's not. So <laughs> it's the reason that we don't take up in breath, out breath in the beginning of the practice because you cannot juggle too many, too many objects. Yeah. There are greatness in the in-breath, out-breath also. 
But if you're a beginner yogi, to take up an in-breath, out-breath, although you can calm down faster than you take up the rising and falling, but you will end up with a lot of calmness. And then you are not going to go anywhere. Very pleasant, very calm. The in-breath, out-breath. One of the quality is good. Therefore, we must learn to how to use this quality, how to use its benefit. Just enough for the development of vipassana. Yeah? But now, I want to talk about, say you take up an in-breath, out-breath, how the noting can go wrong. Even you take up a single in-breath and out-breath. So if, if let's say, uh, so happen that you sit down, the in-breath, out-breath become very obvious to you. A prominent object right now. Uh, and what are you going to do right now? Because it's a prominent object. As I said, the factor for mindfulness to arise, the cause for mindfulness to arise is prominent object. A prominent object. So now you go to the prominent object, you observe the in-breath, out-breath. Now when you take up the in-breath, out-breath, here, if a yogi is not guided, most of the time, the yogi will go into something pleasant and something nice. Instead, seeing the true nature of what is happening. So, when you take up the in-breath, out-breath at this time, because this is a wind element, this is a wind element, this is a reality, this can be directly known. So you pay attention to it. Now, in order for vipassana to occur in the in-breath, out-breath, yeah, you've got to do it something like your in rising and falling. Yeah. You know, in, out, in, out. Then, not only just this, you must know it as long, uh, is it short, is it getting faster, is it warmer, is it colder, is it getting longer and longer, one is longer and one is shorter. You see the dynamicness of the in-breath and out-breath. You see the change in the in-breath and out-breath. You, can, you, you see the pressure that comes in, you can see the, 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 the release, the heat, whatsoever that you can able to notice during this time. Then you are going into a vipassana object. Yeah. But if you are not guided, the same object that you are going to have, then this time when you take up the breath, then you just take up in and out, in and out, in and out. Then you are not seeing any of its quality, of its, of its uh, dynamicness of the whole process. It's just keep the mind still, but the breath is just in, out, in, out, in, out. Then you get calmer and calmer and calmer and calmer. Whatever object of the in-breath, out-breath disappear. Gone. But the thing is that for most yogi, they thought that this is something wonderful. This is something like... If you wrongly interpret the whole thing, you may start thinking, oh, this is emptiness, sunyata. I begin to see emptiness. No self right now, no soul right now. Wonderful. You and your own distorted thinking and distorted idea, distorted all these misconceptions. You see? Same object, a wind element, but pay attention to it differently. You end up on a different path. Yeah? For the most of the time, if a yogi is not guided, even with the in, not in the in breath, out breath, the rising and falling also, they will do it in this way. Yeah? You are being taught to note the rising and falling. You watch the quality of the rising and falling, how it moves, how it changes, what pressure and movement and is going on inside there. But if you are not guided properly, just give you a few um, uh, uh, a few uh, in basic instruction, then you go and meditate. Most of you, if you are not properly guided, most of you, you will end up just like the 
in breath and out breath. The rising and falling, rise and fall, rise and fall, rise and fall, rise and fall. And it's getting subtle, subtle, and it disappear. And it disappear. You sit down there, feel good or not? Very nice. Got pain or not? No pain. Wonderful or not? Wonderful. You get up, you feel good. Very good. This is how the craving wants you to stay there. You just attach to the whole thing. You feel good in it. You feel that you thought that you, you come up with all kinds of, of uh, calmness, emptiness that you may have, and all kinds of wonderful experience that you may have. Yeah. And if you all are still gong gong, you know, ignorant, you know, if somebody were to come and tell you, uh, just because you are, you are wow, so good, uh, your meditation, uh, so deep, uh, so quiet, so nice. Uh, then you also go and follow that also. You're going to follow that because your friends, good friends, all f- doing this way, and then you're going to follow into it. Then, yeah, you follow into that way. And yet, you think that you're doing vipassana. You're not doing vipassana. But you may think that, never mind, uh, consolation, at least samatha, lo. You are not even doing samatha, actually. Because samatha also is not in this way. <laughs> so you are neither here nor there. You are just attached to the whole thing inside there. If you are doing samatha also, if you, want, if you so happen to go into samatha, samatha also does not come with the craving. If it comes with the craving, you cannot even able to develop the jhana. You just get stuck there. So as I said, you are neither here nor there. So even with the right objects that you have taken up, if you don't pay attention to it correctly, then you end up with that, the other, the other aspect. That's why here, because of, its, of its the craving and the observation that comes in, you know, it's so easy for you to drag over to the other side. That's why the teachers are important. The teachers are important. Now experienced, competent teachers are important in these small little things. All your basic instruction you can learn from the books. But when it comes into all these small little things is where the experience of a meditator comes in. Uh, Then only this they can able to help you to guide you back to the right path. Without able to guide you back to the right path, there will be people, teachers, or whatsoever, they will tell you, if you get those quietness, calmness, pleasantness, uh, stay there. Stay there for a long, long period of time. Very nice, very pleasant. Then they begin to tell you, they begin to tell you, oh, you are nearing Nibbana already. Your Nibbana is going to come up. Just sit for a little bit longer. Then one day they'll confirm you, the teachers will confirm you, you also get Nibbana already. Then you feel happy. Then one day, 20 years later, you feel like nothing much. Then you, ha- you are you're on a trip. <laughs> you're on the, you are, you are on the, you, on, you, you, you thought that you're all great, all good, all holy. But you just caught on, the, you just get caught into it. And these things, mind you, they have happened to many yogis out there. Yeah. A lot of times, sometimes we stay in Penang only. Yeah. We do not know what's happening out there. Because we never mix with other yogis from all over in Malaysia or our different parts of the world. Yeah. So if you stay here, only, you only confine to that little bit of understanding. Yeah. So, we, we do see these things happen. And these things happen because it's so easy for the mind to, to go into all these objects, to, to, to go into something quiet, something pleasant, something nice. Instead of paying attention to it's all the characteristics, the dynamic process of the objects. Yeah? So here you must be able to differentiate these two again. Again and again, as you meditate, you must be able to see this. Are you, are you wishing to do vipassana or are you wishing to do samatha? If you want to do samatha, you also must get it right. 
Because let's say for a samatha also, in the in-breath, out-breath, hmm? when you pay attention to the in-breath, out-breath, you must not attach to it. You need samatha, in-breath, out-breath, you need to be clear about the object. If the object is initially not clear, that means your mindfulness is already gone. You need that mindfulness. It needs to be there most of the time. Uh, but you don't see whether it's long, whether it's short, whether you don't see all the individual characteristics. You just in breath, out breath. Until the mind becomes clearer and clearer, it produces a mind-made object that mimics the in breath and out breath. Mm. Uh, uh, then you're going into a path of samatha. So even here, that when you pay attention to the samatha object, it is not just like calmness, pleasantness, nice and cool, and so on. If you think that is samatha, that you are having a wrong misunderstanding of samatha meditation. Uh, so samatha meditation also comes without the craving on the object. The object is still there, it's still clear, but you don't see the process, the dynamicness, the, the changes within the object. But the object is still clear. Yeah? Whereas in, in Vipassana, we take the object, we see it change, we see it, we see it arise, it passes away, it comes again. It, what is going on with that particular object? We begin to see its characteristic of those objects. Then you are in Vipassana. So here again, we must be able to discern. Yeah? Discern the objects correctly, pay attention to the objects correctly if you intend to do on vipassana meditation. Because along the path, even as you go further and further into the development, every now and then, this thing will trick you out from the original path. It will trick you. It will trick you again and again. You kind of like put a honey pot there. You know, you, you are like a, like a fly, and top gets stuck there. Feel good because it's so sweet and nice, but you can't come out from it. Yeah. Uh. So too, our meditation is something like that. Uh, we are trapped by our own craving. Yeah. Uh. And the craving here, it's not just the greed of food. Man. All this greed of food, nah, greed, greed for a companion and so on, nah, these are very gross type of greed. But this type of craving is a very refined type of craving. Yeah? Uh, it takes effort, it takes wisdom, it takes penetration of the mind to see it as it is. Uh, uh. So, now let's say you know how to differentiate it. Yeah? You know how to differentiate it. Okay, you come to the rising, falling. You know how to pay attention to rising and falling. You observe its dynamic process. You observe the pressure. You observe the tightness, rising and falling, getting faster, getting slower, uh, getting up, it goes down. Uh, you notice the lifting, pushing, dropping. You notice pressure here, pulling there, and so on. So you are paying attention. If you are doing it this way, you are paying attention to the actual objects of vipassana. Yeah. Now, reality, reality here means that can be directly known by the mind. And the reality here means the qualities of the mind and body. Different qualities of the mind and body. In the body, there are different elementary forces. And the mind. And the mind, they got a different types of mind. Angry mind, mindfulness, concentration, wisdom factor, intention, vitaka, vichara, and so on. You know? There are so many types of mind that you will have also. Much more than the body. You know? It's much more complex than the body. Now here, while you're meditating, eh? now while you're meditating, you're, you're, you are asked, you are given the instruction to pay attention to these objects whenever they become prominent to you. 
Uh, if they are not prominent, you move on to another object. If the thinking is prominent, you go to the noting the thinking. If the sadness is prominent, you notice the sadness. If the angry the anger is prominent, you notice the anger. You if if the anger is not prominent, the rising and falling becomes clear again. You go back to noting the rising and falling. If the rising and falling is not clear, another itchiness arises. You pay attention to the itchiness. This is how the development of vipassana is like. Yeah? Yeah. This is how the vipassana is like, going through all these type of things. Yeah. So, here, here you see, while you're meditating here for a, say for a number of days already, some people are already one week here, some people are already more than one week here, some people continue from other retreats to come here. Yeah? You are paying attention right now to what we call the individual characteristics of the object. Individual characteristic. The Pali word is sabhava. Sabhava lakanya. Sabhava lakanya, individual characteristics. Individual here means that they are different. They are different from one object to another object. Your rising and falling is different from the heat. Uh, the wind element that you notice is different from the heat and cold. They are very different. Uh, your, say, for example, your uh, hardness, say, say for, for a body or somewhere is hard, you know, then that hardness is different from the warmness or coldness. Individual characteristics. That means the Elementary forces, the four major elementary forces, they all have their particular characteristics, individual characteristics. Your job is to bring your attention to those characteristics that, you, that we are paying attention to. Huh? Uh, then, so too when the mind becomes prominent, you begin to see the anger as a process as a mental process, not the story of the anger. If you go into the story, it will go in more and more, it will get you more angry and more angry. If a sadness gets you more and more sad. Uh, uh. So, we are paying attention to its process. That means that, just like when you're paying attention to your rising, falling, sitting, touching, all the individual processes that you are noticing, so too when the mind becomes clear, you pay attention to the anger. And you begin to see how is the anger is like. Not I, not by, not by I, but just by seeing it as it is. How does it, for example, how does it squeeze the heart, for example, squeeze the mind, pulling, or sometimes how it like burning like that. Or if sometimes yogis they 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 notice the 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 the. the uh, well, the anger that they come to report, well, I see the, the, the whole heart is burning, uh, burning, the whole body is like burning. Uh. And then exactly they see the individual characteristic of the anger, for example, right, right now. Yeah? Uh. So sometimes the yogi begins to understand that um, when we are paying attention, for example, when they are sitting down, then suddenly they feel that the whole mind becomes very alert, very open, very clear, very present being aware of a lot of things, not that, nothing specific in that nature, yeah? but very alert. Uh, that, it shows that the mindfulness is in, the individual characteristic of a mindfulness. Yeah? Sometimes you may have that, you know, you may have that. It becomes clear, alert, in a certain part of your walking, sitting, daily activities. Uh, those are characteristics. Sometimes you may not have an actual name for it, you may not even know that the mindfulness arises, but you feel its characteristic. You feel the sensation is something like this. Uh, uh. Or sometimes you felt that when you walk, uh, all your distraction, kind of like they are very far away, that the whole mind is truly on the lifting, pushing, dropping, and so on. Then you find that, wow, this state of mind, wonderful. Uh, this, you begin to notice the concentration becomes more prominent. Samadhi factor becomes more prominent. And so it's prominent, it becomes clear to the yogi. So sometimes yogi describe 
This phenomena in different words, in different sense. Huh? Uh, then, for me, I know that you are doing something right. You know, because you begin to pay attention to these things. Although you may not know it as mindfulness, you may not know it as samadhi or whatsoever, but you are actually seeing the characteristics of things as they are, as they, it arises. So these are what we call individual characteristics. Huh? Uh, or you perhaps you notice the restless mind how the mind changes, how the thinking mind comes one after another, one after another. This is how you pay attention to the state, different states of mind. Uh, uh, sometimes you may notice, sometimes in your sitting, you may notice your heart keep on beating, beep pop, beep pop, beep pop, beep pop, beep pop. Sometimes how come it beep pop faster? But I don't feel, the breath don't feel so fast. Huh? Then something wrong with the heart, is it? So you try to touch the heart. No, uh, the heart beating okay. Uh. But how can we pop, pop, pop so fast? Then something else, la, you know. Usually the beginning of the practice, you know. In, it, it usually begin to see the different states of mind. Uh. Uh, it comes in like in the heart. Uh, it kind of like jump a little bit. All these things are the nature of the mind. Yeah. You become more clearer, which is good. Uh. Although you may get confused here and there, but... Trust me, when it comes up, pay attention to it. You won't die. You won't die or suddenly stop. <laughs> Sometimes people are afraid that it's going to be palpitation, go back and want to see doctor and so on, you know. <laughs> it's part of the whole meditation process. Just pay attention. Of course, after you get used to it, then you're quite okay. You're quite okay with it. Uh, so all you need to do, you, you must learn to trust your mindfulness. You trust your mindfulness as the mindfulness pay attention to the, those objects. Uh, You've got to see it again and again, again and again, however and whichever it comes in. Uh, the book knowledge that you understand, the, the talks that you have listened and so on, we cannot able to describe everything. We cannot describe everything about the phenomena that you are going to experience through. That's why, as I said, each and every one of us, the phenomena that we pay attention to, the mental states and the bodily forces and so on, they are very individualized, very different from one to another, from one yogi to another yogi. So sometimes you discuss about your own own. Uh, experiences, uh, both of you will get confused also. Uh, so next time when you go back, uh, all this experience is for yourself. Uh, keep to yourself. Uh, you don't have to share with other people uh, because you get a lot of confusion. Uh, or sometimes you get a lot of ego also. How come your non is not the same as mine? Uh, my one is more better and my one is higher. Uh, and all the ego all come up, you know. You got all the calmness or not? No calmness. Still what? Still playing with pain. Uh? Then you feel, oh, see, uh, like she got calmness. Uh, she got calmness. Then all the ego also comes up. So all oh, your meditation, you go back, you keep it to yourself. Yeah? And next time you come back again, uh, your, that experience is you discuss with the teachers, yeah? not, not discuss with other people. Yeah? Because it's all individual phenomena it comes up, yeah? Experiences will experience differently. But as I said, it follows the same principle. Mm. The principle of the individual characteristics of those, those forces and those mental states. Uh, so this one is what we call individual characteristics or particular characteristics. Entry into vipassana towards the further development you need to take up this characteristic. Without taking up these different characteristics of the mind and body, there's no entry into vipassana. There's no further development into vipassana. Because if you cannot see these things, your the further deeper insight of anicca, dukkha, anatta will not be there. It will not be there. So this is the first characteristics of an object. It's particular characteristics. That's what we call the Sabawa Lakana, the first characteristic. So remember, 
again and again you pay attention to it. Uh, the word Sabawa Lakana is also somewhere there. Somewhere in the board there. Uh, but it's just a word. But whether you understand the full impact of it, that's another thing. Uh, uh. Um, so this is the first one. Sabawa Lakana. Again and again as a yogi, you come in to a retreat, anytime you meditate, in the, if you want to go on the path of vipassana, you pay attention to all these individual characteristics of pain, pulling, tightening, tension, and so on. Again and again, morning till night, you do that. The next morning, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. Because if you begin to notice them again and again, they become clearer and clearer for you to see. And it, it, those objects become faster for you to see, in the sense that you don't have to wait for so long. It becomes, because the mindfulness becomes stronger, they become clearer. Yeah? As they become clearer to you, yeah, the forces here, the individual forces here, because of your mind can able to segregate them, different forces and so on. Eh? Uh, this is where it begins to see what we call the nama and rupa. You begin to distinguish out which one is the bodily sensations, bodily characteristics, and which one is the mental characteristics by directly knowing what is going on here. Then you begin to what we call begin to see the insight of discerning of this nama and rupa. The, in, uh, the first insight of vipassana. Because you can able to see it on your own. You can see it, this and this. They are two different things. Sometimes a yogi may, may see, for example, uh, you have to see the, the whole rising and falling process and the mind that pays attention together with the whole process of rising and falling. The mind can able to choose rising and falling or noting the mind. And you can able to see both of it coming together very clearly. Or sometimes in the lifting, pushing, dropping, you can able to notice these are the characteristics of pressure, hardness, movement, and so on in the movement, in the this one there. And yet the mind that pays attention to the lifting, pushing, dropping. With that, the mind able to segregate what is, the met- what is mind and what is matter. Mind and matter. Yeah. So here, if you can able to see those different types of phenomena clearly, yeah, then this is the entry to the, the development of vipassana. Mm. This is how you see nama and rupa, how the insight arises. It comes naturally. But there are people... Uh, yeah, people I have met before, you know. They want because they understand the theory a lot, huh? About inside, nama rupa, no, nama rupa pariche they, they remember all the sixteen inside knowledge, you know, they remember everything. Like, yeah? So because they want to develop fast and good to to get out of this cycle of birth and rebirth. We understand. So what they do huh, in the meditation, huh? they meditate with it. So they keep on Mentally chanting, you know, Nama Rupa, Nama Rupa, Nama Rupa, Nama Rupa, Nama Rupa, Nama Rupa. I'm seeing Nama, I see swing Rupa, Nama Rupa. You think you're going to, just because you start chanting inside there, eh, you think you're going to see something Nama Rupa there. Just because you will see a little bit of hardness, a little bit of softness, a little bit of mind, oh, that one must be Rupa, that one must be Nama. Oh, this one is a bit of hardness, must be, must be, must be Rupa. Or that one must be Dharma. Yala, yala. This is how you would think, and this is not the way of development. It's all, all this thinking I've got to put aside is about each the object, those objects will lay it out and show it to you. Not what you think it's supposed to be, you know. Not how you think, oh, this is Nama Rupa, therefore. I already got inside knowledge, number one. 
<laughs> uh, so easy, might as well go and read a book. Uh. <laughs> yes. yeah, Enlightenment is much more faster than sitting here. Uh, so the insight does not come in that way. The insight is that you pay attention, then all this experience comes in. Uh, ex- all this experience comes in, and then they will show it clearly to you. Not what you think, but it will kind of like hit you in the face, something like that, you know? Uh, but it doesn't come like, 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 like uh, abruptly, you know? It gradually it grows. It gradually, gradually, gradually becomes clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer. And clearer. So this is how the development of insight arises. Not what you think. Again and again, as I said, you put all your thinking, put all your impermanence aside, put all your nama, rupa, everything, whatever you know, put it aside. Just pay bare attention. And every day I am saying this. Uh, the next day, uh, some yogi will tell me on all the opinion again, uh, all the judgment again. Uh, again and again, it will come in in that way. Yeah. But nevertheless, uh, this is how all of us develop. We've got to know our mistakes, uh, where we get caught into it. Now, with this understanding of these individual characteristics, or its particular characteristics, as you keep on noting further, trying again and again, uh, day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out, one retreat after another retreat after another retreat. Uh, then, the stamina, the continuity of the mindfulness, uh, the penetrative factor of the mind, the balanced state of the mind becomes even more and more clearer, more and more continuous. You sit down there, all the phenomena starts coming in. You begin to walk, all the phenomena will start coming in. Not like when you begin to, begin to meditate, uh, you sit down, five minutes, ten minutes later, only a rising falling come in if it comes in. You know? But this time is different. This time, the yogi is more proficient, more clearer, sit down and he, the objects are already waiting for the yogis, which is good in that way because it shows that their sign of development is there. Uh, now, with this, uh, as you pay attention to all these type of things, then the next characteristic of an object will come in. Sometimes you may see it also. The next characteristic of an object. The next object here is called, the Pali word is called Sankata Lakanya. Sankata. Or the, Pali, or the English you translate as formative. Formative characteristics. What does it form? How does it form? Or in another, in another way of looking at it, is they call it the triple characteristics. Triple characteristic here is not your impermanence, dukkha, anatta. You know, it's not that. Uh, here the triple characteristic means a beginning, middle, end. Beginning, middle, ending. Arising, sustaining, disappearing. Okay? Uh, arising, beginning, disappearing. Yeah. So as you begin to meditate, for example, like yesterday, I talked about the pain. When a yogi becomes more proficient in noticing what is going on, then a lot of times you can see this characteristic, that second characteristic is coming to you. But, although huh, sometimes huh, we read, huh, so easy, huh, beginning, middle, and end. Huh, but when it comes into your retreat time, when it comes into your development time, it will not show you all the time beginning, middle, end. It will not show you the beginning, middle, and every time that you're going to, just because that you are clear. Yeah? If you have wrong notion of this vipassana, and you do not see things as they are, or and usually yogis tend to think that just because you, you read about beginning, middle, and uh, every time must see beginning, middle, and. So objects even does not appear to you in that way, you still want to see the beginning, middle, and end. And this is where you get, uh, sometimes yogi gets stuck also. Yeah? Yeah. What do you mean by a beginning, middle, and end? 
a beginning, middle, and end of an object. Well, for example, when you begin to meditate, when you begin to meditate, now, let's say the pain arises. You will not see how exactly it arises, but it's already there. It's already there, painful, 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 but you won't see how it ends. So what you see here is just the middle part of it only. But you see its characteristic, you see its pulling, you see its individual characteristic, but it's only the middle part that you see. You don't see how it exactly begins, how exactly it ends. When you pay attention to the rising and falling in the beginning process, it's just rise and fall. Exactly how it begins, exactly how it ends, you do not see it. That means the middle part, the middle of the, this thing is clear for the yogi. Beginning, ending is not clear. It's not clear. So if it shows you like that, you see it as like that. It shows you in this way, you pay attention to this way. If sometimes yogi, just because they, they read a lot, eh, how come uh, I must... You, the rising falling shows you in this way, or the lifting pushing drop shows you in this way. But just because that you have your theoretical knowledge, then you say something is wrong. How can uh, there's no rising? How come there's no ending? One? I must force myself to go and see the beginning also. Then after that, I must force my mind to go and see the ending also. This is where you get jammed up, where your whole mind gets into tension. Because when you are not ready for it, it will not show you. It will not show to you. So it, it will show to you whenever, whichever level that you are in. Don't try to be gao gao, you know. Don't try to be over smart. The true nature of things. Uh, you try to over smart it, it gives you a lot of tension. It gives you a lot of non progress. You give you a lot of. Your confidence also break. So don't do that. It comes in like this way, it shows, you, it shows you in this particular manner, you take it in that particular manner. Uh, because later part, as you meditate, uh, sometimes the beginning part, oh, sorry, sometimes the middle part and the ending part is not clear. It only shows you the beginning only. How does the whole beginning very clear? How does the middle sometimes is clear? How the ending still not clear? But it is part of the whole development of the insight. Say, for example, that few days ago, I talked about intention. Hmm? I talk about intention. I talk about the wish of the mind to start off with something and then to start moving. Right? So to this time, uh, as you pay attention cl clearly, then you see the arising of a mind. The arising of the mind, you notice something arising, then you notice the arising of a movement. The beginning process become clear. How does it end? You really do not know. But you know how the beginning how the beginning start. So in many ways, in many ways, uh, sometimes the pain you may see how it begins, how it sustained. But actually how it ends, you don't see it because another pain starts already arising. So if it shows you in this way, you take it in this way. You don't, you don't say, it, oh, the pain comes up. How come I don't see the pain end? Ah? Then the next pain, then must, my, my insight is not right. Something wrong is with me. It's not something wrong with you. It's the phenomena is showing you in this way, you take it this way. Not what you think it's supposed to be, what you think it, it must be, you know, just because that you are you are smart enough about your Dhamma, about all your things. If you don't if you don't see it in this manner, you're gonna get stuck. Because every time it will not show you, every time you get frustrated with it. You think something wrong with your meditation. So do be careful. Yeah. So as I said now, our craving uh, can be very strong. Even we take up the right objects also. Even we know the right objects or so, even we are paying attention to the right objects or so, and yet the craving will come in due to your, uh, your opinions, due to your, under, due to your theory, due to your craving, and so on. That's why all these things, you still need a teacher. You still need a proper teacher to guide you through. Uh, uh, uh. So here I'm, I'm saying his, this thing. So beginning, middle, and end. 
So do not only the, the, the objects of the body you have that, but they, this triple characteristic, this formative characteristic, how they form and how they sustain and how they end, are also equally have it in the mental objects. The mental objects. That is to say, sometimes you see the thinking already in the middle. And you could not, 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 the thinking is already there. How it ends? Because you really do not know how it ends because another thinking arises already. You don't see how it ends. You see, yeah, maybe it's not so strong anymore, but you don't exactly see how it ends. Maybe it doesn't have that strength, the power. Before it have, don't have the power, the next object of the rising, falling, or sitting, touching already become prominent. The mind already shifts to the next object. So if you do it in this way, then you're correct because this time it doesn't show you the ending of a thinking. But somehow or another, when you pay attention to the rising and falling, this one kind of like disappear, gone. So well and good, no problem. So keep on paying attention to the present object that you're having right now. Uh -huh. So, again here, the state of the mind, the different state of the mind, you don't see how it, beginning, middle and end, you don't see anything. But there will be certain times. I'm sure some of you, if you are in a regular, in a retreat or so, huh, that sometimes you see the thought is going to arise. You pay attention to the thought, you feel that it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. You pay attention to it, it kind of disappears. This is how you see the beginning, but you don't see the middle, you don't see how it ends. You kind of like the beginning is very clear. Then the next thought is going to come, you feel that it's going to come, uh, the beginning part of it. This is how the whole process comes in, very clearly, the beginning part of it. So it shows you a, a process here. Uh, in other times, in other times, uh, other practice, the later development, it only shows you the end. How the beginning, how it ends, not very clear. But the end is very clear. And that is in the later development of insight. You see how it goes? So if you think that everything must have beginning, middle and end, and you think of it again and again, you can have a lot of problem. These things I do I have to mention, because sometimes, especially in Vipassana meditation, there are sometimes there are teachers, there are sometimes there are instructors to tell you, uh, you come and meditate, uh, the big koi, key in the middle and how it ends. Beginning, middle and end. Then you must put your full force into it, see how exactly how it begins, how it stays and how it ends. If you start off with your whole meditation in this way, you're going to burn out. If maybe you come in for one hour of sitting, you may not see that. But if you do that in a retreat, huh, you're going to burn out because object is not going to show you in that way. So in other words, huh, when you come into a meditation retreat or you come into a, this one, when you want to guide a person, when you want to guide a yogi, huh, you want to guide a yogi, and I'm sure some of you are here are also helping out in the Friday, Monday, or other places also. Uh, if you tell a yogi, you must force the yogi to go and see beginning, middle, and end in the beginning part, then you've got, then you, you, you've got kind of like doing a disservice to the yogi. Yogi is going to go up a lot of tension. Uh, even you be gentle. Uh, you know? If you cannot not put the hand there, and learn to feel, uh, learn to feel first, learn to feel. <laughs> And then so specific until beginning, middle, end. Because these things, every now and then I heard these things. And, and sorry to say, the yogis, when they, when they begin in this way, you're going to have a lot of tension. That's why sometimes in this vipassana meditation, people say, how come I got so much tension, so much tension? So many areas, if you do it wrongly, you will create a lot of tension. Yeah? So, therefore, when you, be, when you do your beginning your meditation, if you want to begin a meditation or while you are in the meditation retreat, whatever that it shows you, however it shows you, you want to show you the end, you learn to accept it. You want to show you in the middle only, you accept it. Even yesterday, you may see something beginning. Today, you may not see it. 
Let it be. Let it go. Ready. See what is happening in the present moment. Because sometimes things already change. Yeah. So the beginning, middle, and end is something. Sometimes it's like this. Oh, sometimes in a little bit further of the development, it shows you all the three, very clearly how how it begins, how it stays, and how it ends. But only for a short period of time only. But after that later part, this beginning, middle, and end also disappear. Or not not to say disappear, but it change into maybe just beginning only or ending only. Or a lot of other characteristics that starts coming in. Uh, this is how the development of vipassana comes in. The triple characteristics: beginning, middle, and end. This is called the sankata lakanya, and these characteristics you are not seeing the true impermanence yet. You think that you have seen all the impermanence is there? Oh, the impermanence! Then the true impermanence is also not the true anicca, also not yet. Therefore, if you have not seen the true anicca, the true dukkha also is not yet. Although here pain, there pain, some dukkha here and there, you thought all the dukkha you have seen, but the deeper one, not yet. You thought you've seen a lot of your anatta here and there, but anatta hasn't come. The deeper part of anatta hasn't come in yet. Also, so it's still a way to go. Uh, so you have to keep noting the arising, passing away, uh, the arising, sustaining, how it passes away. What are the characteristics again and again? You keep noting whatever is shown to you in your practice. Uh, in your practice. No. So this, the first one, is the individual characteristics that you pay attention directly to. As you pay attention directly, it will show its dynamic process. It will show how it arises. Sometimes it show how it sustains. Sometimes it show how it ends. Sometimes it shows you all the three. Sometimes it just show you two. Sometimes it just show you one, whichever it is. So whichever it arises, you pay attention to it. Yeah? Towards the next talk. Yeah? I'll talk about the, the the third characteristics. Only when you turn in the third characteristics, we call it the universal characteristic. Then, with that, nah, only the anicca, dukkha, and anatta starts become clearer. And not only clearer, they comes in from a different perspective. Just because you see one anicca, you know every anicca. No, insight gives you a different perspective of anicca. Insight also gives you a different perspective of a deeper state of dukkha, and insight also gives you the different aspect of anatta. Yeah? Uh, so this is the triple characteristic. We will elaborate that a little bit more on Monday. Yeah? So tomorrow, you all don't have uh, don't have to come. You don't have to come down to the to the hall to to, to here. So we continue meditation. It's, uh, Seven o'clock. To eight o'clock is the sitting, right? So eight to nine you do the walking. Then nine to about nine forty-five you do the sitting. Then you retire for bed. Okay. So we we'll stop here for the night. Huh? Okay.